Hi, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Um, today, my interview with uh, a very difficult person to describe. Um, he's a podcaster and a philosopher, a, a, a cultist, an occultist Christian uh, adult film actor and man about town, um, Connor Habib. Hi, today I talk with Connor Habib. Um, as I said in the intro, he's very difficult to describe. His podcast, Against Everyone with Connor Habib, is great. Um, I'll have links um, in the description of this YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, Connor is just a person whose worldview and philosophy has been kind of consistently interesting um, and kind of wise and unusual. Um, if you want a kind of an alternate perspective um, and unexpected insights, uh, he's kind of he's kind of perfect for that. Um, he's just yeah, he's just kind of an alternative to every viewpoint in a lot of ways. Um, so he he is um, kind of an expert on the occult. He has uh, been a, an adult film actor in the uh, in the past. I don't know if he still is. Um, he has recently, uh, he's going to have a novel published soon. So uh, anyway, it was a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, we get into kind of some of his uh, motivations and some of his thoughts on spirituality. So um, without further ado, I hate when I say that, uh, here's my conversation with Connor Habib. Okay. It's, uh, it's really interesting that I, you're in the outfit that I just <laughs> saw you in on Instagram. Well, I just took that photo like two seconds yeah. ago. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, loving the mustache as it's coming in. <laughs> um, New development. Yeah. <laughs> experimentation. Um, so uh, it, I, I'll, uh, I'll kind of pretend like this is the beginning of the interview now. Um, so, uh, Connor Habib, uh, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Hey, how you doing? Good, good. Um, how's your day going so far? It's good. It's very um, normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's very normal. I woke up and read and wrote a little bit, and now I'm drinking tea, and my rice cooker is going in the background, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> nice. A slice of real life. We're seven hours different, so uh, I, actually, yeah. I actually woke up super early so I could try to be sharp. Uh, for the interview, try to have been <laughs> awake. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. Um, you look very composed. Oh, thank you. Normally yeah. I'm in sunlight, but uh, um, I, my family is also in the house and I, I couldn't bear to uh, relegate them to the, to the upstairs. So <laughs> I chose my creepy ass uh, pump organ from the 1800s as my backdrop in the basement. And <laughs> so, All right. It's the uh, only, it's the, the instrument that is also an innuendo. That's good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so many in new windows. Yeah. So um, thanks for coming on. I, I'm, I'm a fan of yours. And uh, I, I, I don't know. So the way I would describe you is a, a writer, novelist. That's a new one. Congratulations. Uh, thanks. Spiritualist, spiritual practitioner, philosopher, <laughs> poet. You're very hard to categorize, and it's perfectly all right if there's no answer to this question, but I'm wondering how you describe your life work if somebody asks you, what do you do, or whatever. Yeah, um, th I mean, there's no way to describe it, really, yeah. in the sense that I have tried to do everything I want in my life. I think that's the best way to describe it, and with some integrity and rigor, so I'm not just... James Francoing all over the place, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> being an actor or making movies, yeah. being accused of, yeah. Anyway, I'm <laughs> writing, you know, bad fiction, all that kind of stuff. Right. I'm sure he's a nice fellow, but I don't yeah. know. And but I just James Franco 
from time to time. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think there's like this kind of restless way of doing like sort of dipping your toe in all sorts of things. But like, I am genuinely trying to follow up on all my interests, you know, um, everything I've got. So yeah, it leads in a lot of weird directions and I don't really know. I don't really know how to categorize that either, which has been a real problem for me in my life too. I guess it's it's probably only a problem in a career. I mean, I shouldn't say it's only a problem, Hmm. but it would be a problem in a career sense right uh because yeah it's so diverse but i also think it i also think your life and your work and i'm so glad that it has reached some people um you know a a good number of people because i i think of i think of it as an example of like it's actually bullshit that you're sampling a bunch of different things you're doing you know you're doing one whole thing that feels whole to you and you're doing it in the phases and the steps at which it is presented to you or something. That's how, that's how I would view someone like you because when I listen to your podcasts, there's a real coherency there. You know what I mean? It's not like we're mm. encouraged. I think we're encouraged, sorry, and forgive me to rant so early on, but I think we're encouraged um, by the current cultures that we live in to view, uh, to view a life like yours of kind of, of rigor and, and diversity as being this kind of like vacations, little vacations here and there. They're not, they're not, they're not one big work. They're, they are a bunch of little things and it's a way of diminishing. It's a way of diminishing our, our, our paths that we are on. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I care about a lot of things I, you know, and a lot of those things are sort of outsiders to each other because we live in a time when we're really supposed to be specialists and experts. And while specialist and expert knowledge has something to it, it also loses a lot of the kinds of radicality that's brought into action by connectivity. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I was into um, the humanities and, and writing and then, you know, I also got into the sciences and organismic and evolutionary biology. So I was an outsider to science because I was studying humanities. And then I became an outsider to science in another way by being inter- interested in, you know, spirituality and spiritual concerns, which had been with me my whole life, but I really started mm. studying them more deeply while I was studying science in grad school. Mm. And then as a result of that, like, <laughs> I became more of an outsider to doing sex work and porn, which I did for a long time, mm-hmm. you know, cause you're not supposed to be spiritual and, you know, and then, so it all just sort of like, and then anything that you do after you do porn, like you're supposed to be an outsider to it. Like people don't, right. they don't like you to leave that. <laughs> yeah. So, they, think, they think you're opting out by even, uh, by even entering into that space. Right. Totally. Or just that you're not capable of anything else. And that was a big part of the challenge to me was like, if I do this, then I have to really be awesome to be taken seriously. I'm still working on the awesome part, but I do think I've (laughs) like managed to in some ways be taken a little bit more seriously, especially with the podcast, um, having gone for so long now and having such like distinguished and amazing people to have conversations with. But basically like what it really boils down to is I like three things which are books, fucking, and conversation. So I just decided to make those three things my life in one way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. Uh, it, might be a, it might be a stretch uh, to, to equate all of those things, but I definitely equate conversation and sex. Uh, mm. Like uh, not, not equate them as in their equivalent, but um, okay. I, I think there's something much more spiritual that can take place in conversation than, than, we, than we usually expect or or even search for and it can yeah. it can be closer to sex than than you know uh than we think so i'm i'm i am curious one of my kind of i guess themes like i don't really have a mission statement for this podcast but spirituality and 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 mysticism and stuff are, are one of my interests so i'm curious um y- you kind of described your um your path into porn your path into science your and and spirituality did the did the other things you did like the porn and the science did they actually point you in a spiritual direction or or were those parallel kind of streams um yeah uh 
I mean, the sp- not exactly. Like the spirituality was there my whole life um, before I could even conceive of sex, certainly before my body was ready for the kind of sex that yeah. you have when you're an adult. Um, I was raised with no religion and yet found myself taking serious interest in Christianity and magic and all those sorts of things when I was like, I mean, as soon as I, like really some of my earliest memories. Wow. So <clears throat> everything that I've done has unfolded out of that place for mm. sure. And, you know, I always kind of resented, like when I told people that I was going to do, because I was in an MFA program. And when I told people that I was leaving that and leaving teaching um, to go, because I was teaching at uh, to. I was teaching at University of Massachusetts and Western New England College. And then I also got a job in a school just outside of San Francisco. And when I told people I was leaving that to do porn and sex work, like people were like, oh, that's going to be such a great thing to write about. And I always thought I was so Ooh. irritated by that. Yeah. First of all, because I thought it has its own merit, you know, right. but if it's anything, it's, it's a, it's a spiritual adventure. It's not, okay. um, it's not just grist for the mill, you know, it's not just, Ooh. um, you can turn this into something functionally interesting to other yeah. people. It was like, no, um, we all have this aspect of ourselves and I, I would like to integrate it publicly into my life. Mm. Um, and that's been a big version. Another way of talking about the whole sort of life project is to be yeah. someone who is publicly integrated. Right. Yeah. And, and there is, there's definitely, I mean, if you're, if you go into it with intention, I, I would imagine there's a lot of insights into intimacy that can be gained through that, that, you know, that it would bring a a, a different spin on intimacy than anything else you could have possibly done. Well, yeah, totally. (laughs) There's a, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot there. I mean, the first, one of the first things that you really get out of doing any kind of sex work is understanding that intimacy is not a personal thing. It's not something that's waiting for two people to discover because they have chemistry. Actually chemistry is kind of just sort of a lazy I would even wonder if I would call it capitalist like uh, uh, function that like somehow two people meet and like the sparks fly. That does happen sometimes. But when you do sex work, you realize that you uh, can and do generate intimacy and that you can actually Mm. do that with anybody that you want. Mm. So it's a capacity that people have. And to the extent that they decide to... uh, uh, evoke and utilize that capacity and utilize it with one another. That's mm. what's really important. Mm. It, it, it reminds me in a way of uh, the, the image that comes to my mind is of a river um, and an ocean. Um, and uh, and the, the typical person with intimacy in our lives is uh, has has very bounded banks and and boundaries, mm-hmm. and then I'm I'm picturing um, entering into sex work as kind of a a, a delta um, where intimacy kind of fans out, and at first you you think you're experiencing various um, just various little arms of this delta, but the eventual goal is the ocean mm-hmm. uh, of of maybe some kind of connection you know, that exists with all human beings or am I, am I going way too? uh... No, I mean, that's, it's, it's true in the sense that like, if you want to look at that, like, of course, a lot of sex workers just don't really care about that and they just want money and they, or they want to gratify a certain sexual aspect of themselves. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't say that that's lesser than the thing that I'm saying, but certainly like the, I know you're not saying that, but certainly like, doing sex work makes what you're talking about available in some sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to people in a way that it wouldn't necessarily, it it would be available otherwise, but it's much more difficult to come by. Right. So to speak. Yeah. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm picturing uh, Connor Habib entering into that uh, for based on, based on my foreknowledge of you. And that's, that's the image that came to my head, but Uh (laughs) feel free to shoot down any images that I have. uh, (laughs) I kind of have images sometimes that, (laughs) <laughs> come to mind um so um so yeah that's really interesting and so when you were young you were already kind of exploring um spirituality um and i do sense when i hear you speak that that you're just a naturally 
spiritual or sensual person and it and it does kind of create a feeling of uh like it it feels very united um in in the way that you speak about it with your guests and that kind of thing um the way oh, oh no problem the way that i think of you in my life um is do you remember like i i assume you maybe i read the lion the witch in the wardrobe series at some point um do you remember the, do you the remember first the, one only okay well the first the, the lion the witch in the wardrobe not the okay. first one and chrono- chronologically yeah but yeah um so there's a there's kind of a um limbo world at one point that they go into um the children where um it's a it's a forest where the light comes from everywhere and it's full of um pools individual pools and each pool is a portal mm-hmm. to a different world and they they leap into kind of one at random and find a world with kind of a different light and a different um like a, a just just a completely different world from the one that they're used to and i think of your work for me as being uh jumping into one of those pools where it's a it's a <laughs> it's a new world it's a different world and i'm i am surprised sometimes at how much it resonates and how consistent and and, and coherent it does seem um but i come from a um you know a evangelical christian background um which i'm not going to mm-hmm. i'm not going to dis uh, evangelical christianity but uh you know you would have been the, the ultimate boogeyman uh bad boy uh all this porn star homo yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah you, you tick you tick all the boxes and yet uh, <laughs> uh and and yet you know I, I heard you i think it was uh probably a lot of people's introduction to you is on duncan trussell um mm. and uh i was like oh this will be interesting you know when i heard heard your your description that, and then i was just like oh um Oh, not offended yet. Not offended yet. Not offended yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I mean, I, 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 I think offense is is the stupidest uh, uh-huh. human emotion, and I am trying to eliminate it. But I did expect to be offended, and I wasn't, uh, which it, which was refreshing, and and jumped into your work from there. So, um, I, I I am interested in in the occult and the way that that's been a part of your or magic in in, in the occult. Um, mm-hmm. which is which is a part of what you've um, you talk about in your podcasts and and one of the things you you promote is that an occult kind of an occult way of looking at the world is especially useful now um, mm-hmm. in in this time uh, and so I assume like or not I assume do you do you do you have daily spiritual practices like occult practices that <laughs> you take part in sometimes when I'm when I'm doing my best, yeah. <laughs> and then some days it's just, uh, you know, like watching five episodes of Chopped and eating junk food, you know? Like, yeah. it's not, <clears throat> I think people have an image of people that are sort of deeply in occult practice and philosophies and perspectives that, like, they're some, they've somehow perfected the art of yeah. rhythm in their lives. And, you know, but I do. Yeah. Like when I'm at my, when I'm at my best. Yeah, I do. Um, and it's nothing like from the outside, it's pretty boring. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm not, I'm not a magician. I'm not doing elaborate rituals with symbology or anything. Mm-hmm. It's mostly meditative space, mm-hmm. um, and prayer and that's pretty much it, you know? So, I mean, there are other things I do sometimes, but that's very far, few and far between. Mm um and what i what i've kind of gleaned uh about uh the occult and and magic uh is that there's an element of of will and like just sort of uh yeah an element of 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 will and power um being of uh forgive me i'm searching for words of power being kind of a, a neutral thing and the occult is almost like a um and and i want you to correct me because i'm probably <laughs> wrong uh but that the occult there's almost a neutrality to it where you, you you recognize that our will can be focused in um in ways that uh that build growth and and life and ways that lead to 
negation or 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 death or or that kind of thing, and that it's it's kind of a an individual path which way you you go in that. Does that? Yeah, although I, I mean, I think you're just describing life, you know, <laughs> like, like everything is sort of like that, you know, yeah. there's not, I mean, whether it's technology or art or governance or money or whatever, I mean, anything can be used one way or the other. Um, so, you know, yes, you're right. And also that applies to a lot of different yeah. things, right. you know. So how, yeah. how would you describe like, um, I, I don't think, I, I don't get the feeling that you're um, married to one particular thing. Like you wouldn't only be an occultist uh, or like you would, you wouldn't necessarily shy away from a, a, um, a, a ref, an expression of, of, of some kind of spirituality or mysticism from another tradition. But, but how would you describe the occult? Assuming that some of my listeners are uh, mm -hmm. like me, it was a taboo for most of our lives. Yeah, well, I mean, the really easy way to explain it to people who are not in it or are just total secular, humanist, atheist, whatever, um, or, you know, are outside of it for religious reasons, um, is basically just sort of looking at your, like, here's this is a very simple way. It's like, look at your experience. Your experience is really fucking weird. And when you start actually investigating what you experience, then you begin to understand that you take a lot for granted. And in that investigation, it will lead you to surprising things. Mm. So <clears throat> if, for instance, you know, the simplest way is like, if, for instance, you ask yourself or you just take a second and you think, oh, I can't see my own face and I can never see my own face. And I can look in a mirror, but that's a two-dimensional kind of ecology of light and surface and silver or whatever the mirror is made out of glass. You know, like I, I can see that, but that's not my face. Mm -hmm. So I can never actually um, experience what other people experience. And yet I walk around all day taking for granted that I can and I forget about it. You know, you mean you mean you're you can't experience the you that other people experience exactly. Okay, and I and it's particularly a certain part of me. Like, I can look at my hands, and even if I'd like turn my head, I can kind of see my butt, you know. But like, yeah. most mostly, you know, like I can't really see my face except the tip of my nose if I cross my eyes, and if maybe if I stick <laughs> my lips out or something yeah. like that, you know. So, um, the fact of the matter is, like you're having a different phenomenological experience of yourself than anybody else's, right? And they're composing a completely different version of you than you can ever compose of yourself. Mm. So look at something like that. Take something like that and really start to investigate it and think on it and, and include your experience, you know? Like it's not, don't just dismiss your experience. Include your experience as something that's important. Mm. You know, right. and once you start drilling down on that, a lot of weird new things become revealed. Mm. The longer you do it, the more I experience, and I've noticed this with other people, the more you get led into things that look occulty, that look spiritual, that um, reveal a different kind of world to you. Mm. So yeah. that's how I would sort of just present it to people who are you know, maybe interested or, you know, sort of on the outside of it or whatever. Yeah. There are other ways to describe it that are much more uh, filled with, you know, strange things that I could say, but that's a very baseline version mm. of it. Yeah. I, I, I form a picture of kind of a non, it's a non-academic and, and specifically subjective inquiry into the nature of reality through any number of kind of uh, jumping off points. But the, the, I guess the self and the face and, and all that is, is a great beginning because yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've definitely <laughs> been there. You're like, holy shit. Uh, like, you know, there are just, there are so many deep wells to fall into with, with the idea of identity, the idea of, um, like I, I think of uh, the, the the more I think like this, the more I think of of myself as a mystery that I need to sort of have faith in and engage with and have a growing understanding of. And then not only that, so so diving into my own head 
um, excluding all physical reality is a deep well. Diving into my own head or diving into myself through maybe the lens of other people is, is a whole other thing. And it, uh, there's this fractal, uh, you know, this fractal awareness that comes out that it, 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 there's just a, there's always hints that there's more and more and more levels and more and more right. arms of the fractal that you could go down. And so, yeah, I, I, even people like, um, like William Blake, who always kind of couched his, um, spiritual exploration into Christian language. But I mean, he was holding on by a, a thread, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? It was. And, and C.S. And C.S. Lewis. And, yeah. you know, I mean, what you're talking about is that in, inside of you, you have that room with all the pools in it. Right. Like, yeah. So like, and C.S. Lewis was, you know, a Christian occultist essentially. Yeah. He was yeah. friends with Owen Barfield who, you know, urged him to look into Rudolf Steiner and, and same with, token and charles williams and this whole group of people who are really into you know esoteric christianity which is basically my headquarters for occultism so you know it's and blake certainly you know was a huge influence on all of that as well yeah yeah it's beautiful and and that's one of the most surprising things to me is it's not new now but as i as i look into these things and i think i'm you know i think i'm really going out on a limb i'll find a fucking christian there you know what i mean (laughs) Right. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, Christianity is fucking weird, dude. It's so weird. (laughs) It's so weird. In fact, it's weird (laughs) enough that at the end of the day, I am not drawn away from it as a kind of a a, a starting place for me. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like, um, I mean, I definitely, I, I definitely have to open up to, um, open myself up to the mystery of it. And, and, and that is actually what, to me, what faith is, is, is Mm. recognizing that I am stepping out onto something mysterious or or something like that. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, faith, like the way I define and describe faith, just to pick up on what you said is like, faith isn't, being brave in the face of cowardice or believing against non-belief or anything like that. Faith is the arrival of divinity in this, in, in the presence and form of connectivity. So it's like, wait, can you say that again? (laughs) Yeah. I want to type that shit. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, faith is the um, arrival of divinity in the sense and form or appearance of or presence of connectivity. So, Whoa. like, when you're walking through the, your day and you have some sort of doubt or fear or whatever it is, and then suddenly you're like, I'm going to have faith. Like, you're seeing that in the accordance of the arrival of God in the moment. So it's like the presence of God wells up in you. And it's not like, I mean, there is a decision there in some sense, but it's like you've made yourself ready for the present. It's more like rather than you've made the decision, I'm going to be faithful. You've actually made the decision to see God, you know, who's there, who's arrived. And, And you know what's hilarious about that to me is that I have the overall psychic um, impression that I've gotten throughout my, my life and faith is that somehow I'm summoning God, which is actually way more hocus pocus <laughs> than, than what you're saying. You know what I mean? Like I even, uh, you know, I had an interview I was nervous about the other day and I contacted a, um, uh, a, a priest that I know. And I, I said, I need the Holy spirit. And he texted me back. The Holy spirit is with you. And I was like, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, of course, because I had, you know, I had uh, gotten this impression over years that it's this, that actually it's kind of this magical thing, but in this kind of dumb way where I'm like, Holy Spirit, be with me now, come. You know? <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, Watch me pull the Holy Spirit out of this hat, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. So uh, actually, one, that was one of my things is I was going to ask you how you would define the concept of faith. So that's uh, really good. I don't often stop to type something out that one of my guests <laughs> has, 
<laughs> you know, it's funny because you could have typed it after we were done and listened to it and typed it out, but that's also uh, fun. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm so, I guess I'm so in the moment here that I'm, I'm not, I'm not thinking. No, that's good. I, I, I mean, actually, I, I, good. I don't, I don't really listen to the conversations back in full detail usually okay. uh, for a while. I need to, I need to let them go, but I did want to be able to look at that on my screen when we were done talking. So that's, that's, that's awesome. Well, I mean, something you can do, like just thinking about your nervousness talking to somebody the other day, because I certainly, I've had guests on my show that I am like, not terrified of, but like, they're just huge presences in my life. You know, mm. when I had Franco Di Fabrardi, the theorist on, or when I had Maggie Nelson, the, you know, the, the writer and public intellectual, like there are certain people that are just so they loom so large in my imagination. Mm. And, you know, so what I do is what I do when I'm also maybe in conflict um, with somebody or whatever. I just say, um, I'd like my angel to get along with their angel, you know? Mm. And, you know, I imagine or envision or connect with the uh, star of David above my head. And then imagine it above theirs too. And then it's like, I hand it to you guys. Like right. you can get along. And it's actually yeah. a good thing to do if you're ever in a fight with somebody as well. Like if you're just sort of like digging in deeper and it's getting fucking grimy and, and bad, like do that, like take that inward moment. Mm -hmm. And my friend, <laughs> she was like, I told her about that. She's like, I can hear the moment you do that in every episode. And I'm like, I know it must be so noticeable to people that know that to, you mm. know that thing to do because right. um, I can hear it too because I do listen to the episodes before I post them and I can always hear it I'm like oh that's that moment that I did that you know yeah uh, well it's I mean it's beautiful and I I think it's I, mean, I think it's very true like I, I don't I don't think that there is uh, anything kind of uh, well, I don't say or it doesn't feel um, like just a mental picture to me because mm -hmm. one of the reasons I do this is that there has been this feeling of, of connection, um, you know, or that I, that I, at the best of times, try and create where um, it's, it's like, it's the me that I have faith in speaking to the you that you have faith mm -hmm. in. And you're, and you and I are, are the time-based um uh, corporeal expressions of this thing that we don't even know exactly what it is and then i even feel like it creates another presence at, at the best of times mm -hmm. um and uh, i don't know that i'm capable of summoning that in in all situations but it does feel like there's another another presence um and even the more i get into this kind of way of thinking that you're talking about and that you're kind of that you're very good at um, it feels like, uh, you, you know, you're talking about connectivity and, and God showing up and it feels like when, when wisdom in me shows up, it's another, um, it's, it's another being and like, and, and maybe they're all one, but maybe this is just the face that, that, that it decided to, sh that God decided to show or when love or when selflessness or care show up, um, uh, that they, that they are, I mean, it's a Congress uh, of of angels in, mm -hmm. in me i don't know if that makes any sense yeah um, it does <laughs> yeah um and and like yeah I, I just uh i i think the fact that it's apparent that that's happening in your conversation i mean to me that's you're 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 doing god's work out out in the world you know and i and i i, I just i affirm that and i do love that um so um so I guess uh, since you did, you, you knocked the faith thing out of the park. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, um, um, I wonder what you would say or how you would define the concept of power. Yeah, um, that's a good one because w what I'm always trying to do is sort of walk away from power and dissolve it. Um, and rather than seize it or use it mm. um which is sort of a power move <laughs> in and of yeah. itself <laughs> uh but 
I, I mean, that's also a Christian lesson, certainly, yeah. which is, you know, turn the other cheek. Uh, and of course, one way to destroy your enemy is to turn the other cheek. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. Um, you've got to do it without that being the goal. Right. As far as what power is, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I've tried to answer it before um, for myself because I saw people using it all the time. And I always get irritated when people use terms without defining them, mostly because like defining terms is now a radical act because we're so used to processing and parroting whatever terms are handed to us. Yeah, Webster's. And, yeah, exactly. Like, or, well, it's like Twitter's dictionary, you know, <laughs> like, so, you know, like people would read Foucault and use his definition of power all the time. Mm -hmm. And first of all, not understand it, but also just sort of reproduce it and all that. And I just found myself not interested in that. I tried to think like, well, what is it to me? And I came up with an answer, like, I don't know, like 10 years ago, but it's, I don't remember what I said then. So yeah. let me, you know, um, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a sort of a stepping into the kind of currents, some of the currents that form the world. In other words, formative currents mm. and distorting them. Like mm. that's basically it. It's like, now we, we can talk about power in a lot of different ways. Someone might say, well, it takes power to like open a door or it takes power right. to, Force. you know, grow. but, but I don't know. Uh, I don't really agree with that. I would say yeah. that like power is a distortion of the sort of those kinds of currents that are mm -hmm. being used in the waste. So that's as close as you're going to get from me. I mean, I'd need to sit down and think about it for a really long time. And so I am thankful that you're asking me that question because um, it's one that I should re-answer. But there's something about it being like, you know, becoming a dirty lens that the clean sort of current and you know, uh, air of the world formative forces is passing through. That's mm. it. It's like the coming together of those two things. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And I, I guess, yeah, I, I think, um, what I'm where, where I do, I do agree with that. And I think, um, you're describing human power, um, because mm -hmm. to be, um, to be a lens that distorts uh, a flow that's already in uh, in progress means that there is this there's this wild untamed power um, <laughs> that that we are are a lens for or are um, are subverting or are are bending to our will in some small way, and that definitely is consonant with. Um, kind of how how things seem to me it's like we we um like the ultimate um the ultimate flow uh and the ultimate sort of reality is is a a flow of existence in which we would completely dissolve um and that as a um as an ego or uh, sorry, and I'm, I'm riffing on, this is not a prepared thing. So uh, That's okay. <laughs> as, as, as an ego, as a, as something that feels it is particular in space and time. Um, and as a human being, we have like a, a unique ability to take, um, we have a unique ability to put our foot in the flow or to, um, to, to shape ourselves, to change the flow of reality um, and, and, and assert our power and assert, um, ourselves into reality in a way that I would say um, it, if you consider the flow of reality and the, uh, and, and whatever re reality and God, whatever that is, um, our assertions of power are always going to be uh, small ripples and might move out from us. Um, and, and, you know, we'll always, we'll always be subsumed again into the larger, whole um so i i guess one of the one of the things about religious faith that is compelling is this idea that there is a power that we um we don't assert there's a power that we uh mm. get get back to <laughs> dissolve into uh, release ourselves to uh 
uh, does that make any sense? Kind of surrender yeah, to Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like all that. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I agree that it is always small, like that the, that the, what humans uh, do by sort of standing in the way of that current of power or standing in the way of that current and transforming into power is always small. I think mm. that, I think that that current is here for us. So mm. when we turn it into power, it's actually rather large. Um, it's a big deal. But mm. but it doesn't stop it from flowing, right? Like I like it doesn't stop that current from flowing just because we sort of distort it into power. So I understand what you're saying, um, but I would say that actually the the repercussions are really big. Mm. You know, like if you know uh, <laughs> people, especially environmentalists, hate this line from the Bible about dominion, right? That like it's all mm. here for us, basically. But I think that that's pretty clearly true. It's just misinterpreted by a lot of Christians that mm. like, well, that means that you can just have a factory farm, you know, or <laughs> whatever, right. the fact, yeah. you know, and, and no, it's like, that's, there's caretaking because it's here for us, mm. you know, um, we should understand that it's a constant act of love. And I think that because it's here for us, our actions have huge, uh, huge repercussions, even mm. our thoughts, um, even so I, you know, so I agree with everything you're saying except that part, I think, sure. but I think that that part makes a big difference. <laughs> so yeah. like in some ways I totally agree with you and in other ways, I think that we are sort of di sure. diverged, but I know you're actually also just, you know, it was your off the cuff answer. So yeah, I'm riffing and I, and I do enjoy the, um, I do enjoy what you're adding adding to the thought or shifting in the thought because, um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I guess I was, um, I, I maybe, I maybe did zoom out to, uh, uh, to a much more, you know, evolutionary scale of time. When I say that where things, uh, the individual power that I assert might, uh, uh, it is not as large. I guess I just mean it's not as large as, as the, the flow of reality itself or something like that. But you, you're definitely right where we can, we can do we can do great things for for evil or for negation or for non being um, mm -hmm. we can we can resist and we can assert um, i guess we can i mean I, I mean i guess the the concept of asserting power or asserting dominion is is maybe where it um, where it falls down as opposed to uh, taking part in or uh, mm -hmm. dominion or in in um, enacting um enacting a dom the dom a dominion over life in a way that um it, it that flows from life itself rather than stopping it or something well, like that well like look at it this way it's like the dominion is already there right that's been granted mm. so the idea that you have to exert will to create that dominion is incorrect right like you have to actually be part you have to approach it in grace, which right. is something very different and approach it in some ways in submission Yeah, because it's already been granted. So like people that use power in those situations, they're doing the wrong thing. They're actually stopping up the flows there of yeah. how things naturally are. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, and I think that in any of my experiences of God that um, have actually shaped me in you know, have been life giving to me. It feels much more like a a beckoning to uh, a a work already in motion. It feels more like mm -hmm. a beckoning, uh, a still small voice, rather than a you know uh, than an assertion of of will over me, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. and even even within my own mind, um, I I grew up with a feeling of my mind as a, as a house of rooms, and uh, and that God. Um, if I summoned him properly, would clean my house. <laughs> uh, that God would, you know, so that uh, so that God was always portrayed. Um, I shouldn't say always portrayed. This is the lens I'm I'm putting on it. Looking back, God was portrayed as 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 asserting. Uh, I'll say himself because that is definitely the the way it was portrayed to me. I don't necessarily feel a, a warmth towards that the he in there, but. Uh, 
uh, you know, that either God was going to be a punisher asserting his will or would come in and, and, and grasp uh, my nonsense and, 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 uh, and shape it into hmm. whatever his will happened to be. Uh, and I, I was just the, the vessel for that. And, and so that, I don't know, that, that seemed like maybe a harmful, a harmful way to view God as, as, you know, I, I don't know if that's, I'm petering out here, but that's kind of. <laughs> yeah, what, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so based on this kind of, uh, um, one of the th things we've been dancing around, but haven't talked about specifically is identity. Um, and, uh, and, and I guess specifically kind of, um, individuality. I was curious what your take is on, on the notion of the individual and, and the ego in all this. Yeah, I mean, I think we've entered a time where the correct, in quotes, political thing to say is that the individual is a function of capitalism and egoism. And there are certainly lots of spiritual traditions that say that as well. And I think they're all wrong. <laughs> I think um, what is needed now more than ever is an intensification of the individual and individuation but not to the expense of the other um mm. it's it, it's seen like you can't really see how many relationships you compose and are composed by unless you start reflecting on the self and so it sort of goes back to the question from before when you asked me about what the occult is and you sort of just describe some of your own thoughts about it which is you know we need to start our our questioning especially for our politics but for our philosophies and all that as well with what is the human being because all the knowledge that we come up with and all the answers that we create in philosophy and politics and medicine and science everything it's all unfurling from the human being so if you don't know the ground from which it's coming then you have a real problem mm -hmm. and um and the question, what is the human being, can only be asked of you, by you, and by you, of you. Like, you can only really ask that question about yourself mm. and get the answer because I can't think your thoughts. I can't be inside your mind. Mm. So there's a real intense question there. And... One again, it's like that's the face thing again. It's like once you start doing that work, a lot of things begin to unfold and become mm. mysterious and weird, and then you can start building, you know, politics and ideas out of, of the world out of that. Now, we obviously don't have time for that all the time, and I think that this is something that, you know, um, collective political action is correct on, which is. Like sometimes you just got to take action and you've got to find solidarity with comrades or you've got to um, be in the fight, you know, and you got to be on the ground taking action now. And I think that that's correct. But we also have to understand that when we take action out of a limited perspective, um, that's not addressing what is a human being, those actions will always have deeply unintended and damaging consequences. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you know, like if a bird flies into my house, I'm going to usher it out. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter what else I'm doing, what I know, like maybe that bird is being chased by a hawk or whatever. I don't know that. And like, I think that like the immediate thing I got to do right now is get this bird out of the house. Otherwise it's going to die in here and it's probably going to knock over some dishes and shit all over my floor. Right. Right. So like, I've got to help it for me. I've got to help it for its own sake. And I've got to put down everything else I'm doing to do that. And sometimes that's what action is required and i'm not going to be like right. what is the bird what is the human being like what are the kind? you know yeah. but i think that we really need to be asking questions of the individual and surprise the only way to ask a question is as an individual so yeah. it's yeah. like yeah. it's it's an inescapable sort of uh confluence mm -hmm. yeah the the, the the individual has been like, it's, it's kind of a, a weird uh, situation with capitalism where um, it seems like the individual uh, is, is the most important 
building block. And yet there do seem to be all these kind of shadowy things in place that um, don't mm -hmm. want us to, um, don't want us to look into ourselves. So it's like, you're an individual, right. but don't think about it. You're an individual and your, what makes you individual is your preferences, is your aesthetic uh, preferences and don't look deeper because, um, yeah, that, that is something I have felt is that individuality is, is such a misdefined thing and it's something that's been kind of, it seems to me, co-opted by, right. by and, the and system. And misunderstood, like that idea, the idea that capitalism is all about the individual, it might seem like a good resistance strategy against capitalism, but it's, it's completely wrong. Like capitalism is about uh, creating kinds of ideological collectives that it can control, mm -hmm. you know, and creating identities and creating brands, <laughs> uh, certain kinds of belongings and relationships that it yeah. can have a handle on that it can sell and sell shit to and buy shit from and create and stop all these flows. So it's not about the individual and it's terrified right. of individuation. Yes. Um, yes. You know, as you, as you're saying, and so like the answer is not to fight capitalist collectives with communist collectives or socialist collectives. But I do think that those have value and we should theorize through those things sometimes and take action through those lenses sometimes. Yeah. I also think it's like, no, it, it's, it, there, there's something about um, like really, again, just really understanding the human being and asking yourself what that is, you know, mm. um, before you take action. So, I mean, that, you know, some people call that anarchism, but anarchists, some anarchists also hate the idea of the individual. Some of them love it, you know. Right. So, um, but you're right in saying it's like ill-defined by any of yeah. these systems. And a lot of these systems are also economic based, which is a bullshit way to base politics right. um, and a bullshit way to base ethics and, and, and morals. So um, it's not going to come up with, you know, reasonable or, or well, reasonable. It's not going to come up with a uh, deep answer. Yeah. I mean, the, the, like what you were describing earlier about looking at your own face is like, uh, you know, there aren't very many steps between really looking at yourself and some kind of, of spiritual world where all of a sudden the structures in place and the power systems in place are, are seen as just kind of arbitrary and, and you know, like, it, I mean, a, a real individual um, is, is dangerous to that kind of, uh, to, to the kind of systems of control. And, and, it, and it, it could be like, you know, what you're identifying there, that the that individuality is feared by uh, by the system is uh, but but has somehow been branded you know as part of the system it's like this beautiful uh, or like not beautiful but this kind of terrible co-opting uh, and and I've experienced uh, I recently kind of had this experience because I was looking into this thing called the Enneagram I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram mm -hmm. and uh, and you can find people, uh, Christians on, on uh, I, I guess they're probably mostly Christians on YouTube, uh, describing how the Enneagram is, is a cultish. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm not here to promote the Enneagram uh, by any means, because I think it's, you know, I think it's a way to start kind of giving language to some kind of self-reflection, and I do enjoy it. But mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I picked up on that I'd never really heard expressed directly was the fear in the fear in power-based religion of uh self-knowledge and individuation because they were like and people people will say their their enneagram number like it's exactly the same as saying their astrological sign <laughs> uh you know and it was like uh uh there was definitely this fear of, of self-understanding and and it's like um, you see almost the fear. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too negative. I just thought that was kind of a, an interesting yeah. thing. One of the first times I'd seen the fear of the individual and under self-knowledge. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so it, it just, it was kind of a, a crystallizing moment for me. And, and I do think 
that you're you're right when you um like when you kind of characterize this as uh, the self as kind of a um i think the word subjective has been maybe um maybe uh wrongly vilified as well um especially when it relates to spirituality um you know all of it is subjective meaning it is just it's individual um, right and uh and it's it's experiential and uh yeah yeah i mean i think just what you're talking about with the enneagram reminds me of how people like quote unquote canceled bell hooks you know this black <laughs> the theorist for saying beyonce sucked basically <laughs> oh. and like and so, uh, bell, bell hooks are like a huge part of your theorizing is about self-actualization and i don't um i don't want to misrepresent her because i'm only sort of just a little bit familiar with her work from reading mm -hmm. a little bit of it mm -hmm. but um it doesn't surprise me that a kind of cultural industry which props up uh you know a millionaire as someone who is interested in ending oppression you know because there's an identity industry built around her would come into conflict with uh someone of that same identity background well overlapping you know mm -hmm. identity background um because you know who says that self-actualization is important right like that's how these things that's how these conflicts start like people latch on to a figurehead that's been generated by industry you know and position it against someone right. that say no we can all we can all be this we can all do this we can all mm -hmm. understand ourselves yeah. and therefore engage in the world in a more ethical, moral, and loving way, a more thoughtful way, and a way that's more gratifying to all of right. us. And those things come into conflict all the time. So right. it could be the Enneagram, like the Enneagram, if it gets too big, will just become this other version of, you know, right. like, a, but yeah. as a tool yeah. for understanding or the I Ching or whatever, whatever version of like, you know, or the Myers-Briggs or whatever yeah. it is, yeah. Yeah. you're yeah. right to point out that they're not really good systems for like they're too bound and limited and they tend right. to pin people down into this or that you know sort of diagnosis might be yeah. the word to use but if people use them as a springboard for understanding and then go beyond them that's great and that would of course be threatening to people that have an organized produced system that has happened through industry because christianity as multifaceted as it is you know, it has all these different pathways, all these different ways you can take it. But the people mm -hmm. objecting to the Enneagram have their sort of Beyonce version of it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I, I think, yeah, what, what you're saying with the Beyonce thing makes me think of um, kind of a, a mantra that I have of, of like, uh, it's kind of a no messiahs uh, mm -hmm. mantra. And it relates to my personal epistemology that's kind of been forming and taking shape, which is kind of uh, like, this idea that uh knowledge in the way that we've defined it is is a is a toxic thing it's kind of a stopping of the flow uh like kind of a the the modernist and uh i always say modernist but we you know in the context of this conversation capitalists could could be thrown in there as well um there's this there's this idea of knowledge as something uh contained uh and owned and uh, you know either in a messiah individual or in an in a, an ideology uh some kind of a dogma and and that that's what we're actually searching for and that's that's our ultimate goal is to be um a storehouse or an embodiment of this kind of knowledge uh mm -hmm. where the knowledge speaks through us uh instead of of knowledge being something that always gets pulled through its own asshole um you know what i mean like uh <laughs> that maybe even maybe even the like maybe even the the whole life and death of christ was that it is a is an allegorical uh you know i'm imagining getting sucked through an asshole now and i can't stop this. <laughs> but uh uh you know and and then it becomes something else on the other side again uh, and uh and so the 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 good thing about maybe uh characterizing christ as the as the messiah of all is is maybe just that um 
we're always looking at uh, like we should maybe always be looking beyond the Messiah to uh, to whatever I, I don't know just to I'm kind of I'm kind of petering out there but uh, it was a, an, an image that came to my head because Beyonce is you know you, you could view Beyonce as a Messiah it starts with the idea of the role model and then uh, all of a sudden uh, she's a Messiah which isn't even necessarily her you know her intention but so the real so the the real evil is, is that in the situation is that that idea of containing uh containing virtue as a uh as an owned object mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i always picture it like a, i picture it like a sharp i picture knowledge in the modernist epistemology as being like a a, a sharp flake that you've chipped off of reality that you think and, and and you put it into your soft tissues and your and your and your muscles and your organs are grinding around it but that's what you consider to be the only uh you know that you consider that to be important and you own it so it's important even though it's begins to tear you up like you know what i mean like this knowledge mm -hmm. shrapnel because we don't knowledge you know that reality is too big for us to know and contain so rather than 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 being something knowledge being something that is uh, a pattern is is a as a recognition of of patterns that that keep us moving forward to bigger patterns or or to the next level of the pattern it's it's something that we own and like i mean it's a very capitalist idea that no you know i i've owned it and that putting in putting in my striving in my church is is my payment for the knowledge that i have does that make sense yeah, well, I mean, shrapnel is a better again. word. Shrapnel is the best word for it because it's not, it's not something that someone chips off. You know, a shard. It's like it's something that's exploded into them. You know, and is a wound that is very difficult to extricate. And in some ways, you know, it's like some people have shrapnel where if they remove it, they die, right? Right. Because it's been lodged in a certain way. And so for some people to even try to remove that is 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 dangerous for them. But they didn't put yeah. it there to the intention. It's been right burst into them by violence yeah yeah and i love that i love what you're adding there yeah it's like so what am i supposed to do remove my knowledge have no knowledge you know and <laughs> it's like well yeah maybe maybe don't have the not maybe we don't need the knowledge we've been told we need it or something mm -hmm. and you know i mean uh yeah maybe maybe the best thing is to sit in in stillness and to to have faith that um I can't that we can react to reality as it as it comes to us uh and, and in love uh, instead of um kind of this memorized script or this uh autonomous uh motion through life i don't know i'm i'm really out <laughs> i'm really out there right now <laughs> no it's good <laughs> <laughs> um so um yeah i mean I, I think we're kind of coming to a nice natural um ending place uh from my perspective um but uh i do want to to give you a chance to promote some if you have anything like you have you have this this novel that you've you've written <laughs> yeah. um and ca um can you can you kind of briefly tell me about that like i'd love to sell some copies for you well uh, you won't though because it won't it's not out until like <laughs> summer so okay. um, All right. unless you're holding on to this episode till then but <laughs> maybe people will get it in their brains um mm -hmm. yeah it's called Hawk Mountain and it'll be out from Norton and the US and Penguin Doubleday in the U in Ireland and the UK um but that's not till next summer so and it's okay. a, it's kind of a I don't know, like a literary horror novel in a way. Um, awesome. And yeah, so I'm very excited for that. And I just announced it, you know, a couple of days ago. I've, I've been sitting on it for a while because I knew, but it was sort of everything yeah. was still being negotiated. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, mainly it's just the podcast right now um, against everyone with Connor Beeb, And that's, you know, linked through my Patreon, which is mm -hmm. patreon.com forward slash Connor Beeb. And yeah. there's uh, like right now, while everybody's in, uh, isolation in their homes and all that. I have been doing this thing every night, every single night, except Tuesdays called nobody's together. The virus yeah. sermons where I meet with patrons and I talk for a half hour about a topic. Sometimes I have guests on, um, like tonight, uh, I have Alex Vitali who wrote the end of policing and we're talking about resisting police power, mm -hmm. um, and enha enhanced police power. I had, uh, Mary Helen Hensley come and talk about her near death experience to talk about, mm death i had you know uh 
anyway, I, I've had a lot of guests on and where I talk about something that, you know, is interesting so people can take interest and be active participants in a way rather than just sort of passive, passive spectators in this mm. moment, um, organizing, how to organize in this moment, all that kind of stuff. So that's, I mean, that's going on and anybody who's a patron at any level, even if it's just a dollar a month can, you know, attend those. So that's mm. been awesome. I mean, that's been taking up my time every day, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. I, I give a different one every day. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and what I've noticed of you is that you're, you are, you're quite meticulous. Like your notes on your episodes uh, <laughs> are, are meticulous. And, and so I'm imagining you do this with all the intention that you put into that other stuff. So I haven't been <laughs> not, able to. Not quite as much because it's every day, but you're right. But thank you. That's a yeah. nice thing to say. <laughs> I haven't been able to attend one yet. Cause I mean, I have, I have little kids and I have a job and I actually can't do too many things that have to happen at a very specific time. So, yeah. uh, but I've been, I've wanted to, it sounds, it sounds really cool. And I do encourage everybody to check that out and check out the podcast podcast because there's there's something there um and so jump into the alternate reality of uh of connor <laughs> abib and maybe make it less alternate uh uh so yeah thank you so much for being on the show it's one of the you're one of the people that i wanted to talk to right since the beginning before i'd even released any episodes so this is a huge uh, honor and privilege and, uh, and, and kind of like life goal attained. So oh, man. thanks. Um, <laughs> That's really Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy that rice that you were cooking. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. It went off. I got to go All get right. it. <laughs> and, and have a great it's going to keep warm now. It's getting crispy. So. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks again, Connor. And All right, man. Yeah. Great. Nice to meet you. Thanks nice for meet you listening too. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Have a great rest of your day. You too.